if the attacker could just flip that one bit in the registry, let's say, um, then they would, you know, could achieve some desired effect on the security posture of the system. Let's see what happens uh, with ASCBC plus the diffuser. So again, the attacker modifies this one little bit. We changed it from 58 to 59. Now we decrypt. And notice how the entire sector now is, is that, that one change propagates across the entire sector. I'm running a little bit behind time. I'll, I'll just pass this slide. These slides are going to be published. You can come back to here. Here's some other issues um, uh, with ciphertext manipulation threats. Let me underline this transition. So we just discussed a lot of threats against BitLocker in the TPM only mode. That's the mode that the user doesn't have to put in a pin or a USB dongle. In this second section, we're going to be discussing threats against BitLocker in its advanced mode. So let's look at TPM plus pin. Let's look at it a little bit slower. So the same thing happens with the Prios environment. Everything is measured in the chain. Uh, each link measures the next link, puts the measurement into the PCRs, passes control to it. But in the TPM plus pin mode, there's one additional step that happens. And the, end, the user has entered in a pin. You, hear, you see here 1337. And the next step that the TPM will do is make sure that the pin matches the seal process. And only if it matches um, will it release the key to boot manager and then the volume is unlocked. So one attack against the pin then would be brute forcing it, right? So let's say the, the, the user configures um, BitLocker to use only a four-digit pin. By the way, it can be four to 20 characters long. And this is configurable across um, group policy and in the domain. So let's just say um, that they choose a four-digit pin. Well, on average, they're going, you know, the attacker is going to guess this in 5,000 tries, right? And if, if the lockout or the timing was linear in some way, well, then this would be an obvious attack point. TPMs, though, come with anti-hammering. And the basic uh, concept of anti-hammering in a TPM is the geometric progression of failures um, on the geometric progression of failures. So let's say the first failure, uh, the lockout period is 10 seconds. The second might be 100 seconds, and the third might be 1,000 seconds, and so on. So you get the geometric progression, which makes the brute force, even on a four-digit pin, much more difficult and time-consuming. It's not more difficult, but more time-consuming. Another threat against the pin is, is uh, keyword analysis. So um, the reason why BitLocker doesn't use full keyboard is localization problems across all of the keyboards. So for V1, we limited it to function keys. For many keyboards, the numerics wall can also be used. The problem with this is, is that the function keys aren't often used. So an intelligent attacker might look at the function keys and do analysis on their where to try to determine which digits are, are used in the pin. I, as an aside, I, about a year ago, I used this method to get into a building I had legal access to. I, I was locked out. I went around the side, and there was a keypad, 10-digit keypad. Well, one thing that I noticed very quickly about the keypad, keypad was that only four of the keys were shiny. The rest were dusty and dirty. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't take too much intelligence to realize that perhaps those four keys are the keys used in the pin to unlock the door. And to my surprise and glee, uh, those four keys numerically you know, uh, increasing were the actual pin. I, I got into the door the first try. So, um, the negations here to use longer pins, more diverse ones. Um, 
And this, again, can be controlled through group policy. And also, I think I mentioned this, the numeric keys could be used in many key keyboards. Um, that would effectively mitigate this because the numeric keys are, are used a lot. Boot root kits. This slide really is to clear up some confusion. So, BitLocker does a really good job of detecting boot uh, root kits installed offline. I mean, by offline, I mean someone uh, has access to your, your machine, um, manipulates the image on the disk, and then you get it back. Um, BitLocker will detect that very well. BitLocker also will detect modifications to the pre-OS environment that come through the OS. As long as the rootkit, which has, is on a high privilege thread, doesn't know about BitLocker. As soon as this rootkit is, is cognizant of BitLocker, and if, if the, the attack requires access to a high privilege thread in, in the kernel and such, then it simply can manipulate BitLocker. Right? It can turn BitLocker off. Right? It can write the secrets to disk. Right? So, um, the mitigations here are, are the SDL, uh, this OS security, uh, configuration best practices. Um, yeah. It goes without saying that, especially in the TPM only mode, the basic mode, that if the laptop doesn't have a good win login OS password, then the attacker can boot to it and then you know, try a simple password. So. Another area of attack is what I call a multi visitor premeditated attack. Uh, some people call these the two touch attacks. So this is where the, the, um, the system becomes vulnerable. Security is hobbled prior to its loss. So, for instance, if, the, if an attacker has access to the laptop before it's lost and you know, puts a hardware keylogger in, and then you know, captures your, your password, your PIN, um, or your, your win login password, then if the laptop is lost at some later point, they're going to be able to use that information to gain access to the laptop. There are many of these advanced strikes. Again, it's best practices, for instance, right? Anything that would keep multi-visit uh, multi access to a laptop um, through best practices would, would be an uh, effective mitigation against this. I'm running a little bit behind time. This is another slide that pretty much uh, says everything by itself. And access this online once the presentation slides are. This basically talks about um, cryptographic issues. Um, and some of the stuff that we looked at. Oh, I, I should mention here too that um, BitLocker's had extensive internal review, obviously. I mean, I work on, uh, with a small team of people. Um, we've also engaged with, with uh, several external security vendors, some, some of which are here at this, this uh, packet box. Um, and, and also, we're, we're going through uh, FIPS and common criteria. The, the external engagements are continuing to. This is an ongoing process. Uh, this is just V1 BitLocker. We're, we're already working on V2. Another area um, of attack is what I call lost, lost while unlocked. And this is where, uh, and this is common. We, are, we already live with this today, right? So if, if you authenticate to your, to your system today um, and then walk away, and someone comes along, they can log in, or not even log in, they, they can start using their system as you, right? They don't have to authenticate. Um, same way with, with many products, security products, if the user has authenticated at some point in the, in the past, and then they lose the system, well, then that, that authentication is not needed. So the, the attack, or the scenario here is, is that um, the BitLocker user is using it in, in let's say, the USB mode. Uh, they boot the system by putting their USB key in, uh, into the port, boot up, you know, log in and stuff like that, put the dongle into their pocket, and then they'll walk away or something like that, and then someone steals it. Now, I also call these attacks one chance attacks, because if the, if the attacker doesn't know about BitLocker, doesn't know how you know, that they have one chance, and they power the system down, and they remove the battery or something like that, and they've lost that opportunity. 
because now when they try to boot, they're not going to have the dongle. So what happens if a system is lost while it's unlocked, then it becomes vulnerable to the same attacks that we saw in, the, in BitLocker's basic mode. Uh, the physical memory attacks, the cheap and easy distributable attacks. Um, one thing to note here, too, is, this is that one way of reducing the chance that your system is lost while it's unlocked is, is to make sure that, that you hibernate, right? So um, if you're, and this could be controlled through group policy. But by, by the way, um, I should mention that uh, the hibernation file with BitLocker is encrypted, right? This is great, because right? that's, that's an easy way for, for information disclosure is through the hibernation file. Page file also, right? So what's great about BitLocker is that all that stuff is encrypted. Um, this is this is a slide from this is my drawing because I didn't uh, get permission to actually use the photograph um, from Peter. Um, it's, it's not even Peter's uh, slide or photograph. And this is starting to get to be really hard. This is a very expensive, very difficult attack, um, but I included here just. Uh, for thoroughness and completeness. But um, Peter Gutman, I'm not, sure, Gutman uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with him, he wrote a really good paper in like 94, 95 uh, concerning data remnants on, on hard disks. And uh, so he, he's often quoted with like, well, how many times should I wipe a hard disk to make sure that no one ever, ever, ever can read the residual charge on the hard disk? Um, and I think that his famous number was 27 or 35, something like that. Um, uh, he says nowadays the data remnants on hard disk is kind of a thing of the past because of densities and, and such. Um, but in 2001, he wrote another paper uh, discussing data remnants in semiconductors in, in RAM, uh, physical RAM, as, as an example. And here you see what happened. The, the, the two gray boxes are magn magnified cells on a physical RAM. What happens is when these cells retain their same charge over a long period of time, you start to get you know, atom migration to certain areas. See this, these little black dots here pulling, uh, forming a hilla, an example of that. And here's what Peter calls a whisker. Well, over time, when this physical RAM has the cells have the same value, you start to be able to detect these charges long after the, the dims have been, uh, power has been removed. So Peter's been able to do this with just the, the plain OEM port, so he hasn't modified the dim whatsoever through experiments. Um, he also can do this with mechanical probing. This is where he puts the, the dim into an acid bath um, and exposes internals of, of the dims there. And, and of course, there's the focus ion beams also. Um, you, you can read all about this in his paper that's um, this is at the bottom here. It's a really interesting read. Um, he's a really uh, talented man. A couple of points about pen testing BitLocker. Um, I mentioned this already. Uh, the BitLocker penetration team, there's three people on it. Um, I'm, I'm just one of them. Uh, we collaborate a lot with Microsoft's SWI team. That's the Secure Windows Initiative. That's uh, my, my colleagues yesterday are from the SWI team. Um, I mentioned that we had several engagements with external security vendors. Um, many, many, much a lot, a lot of work with uh, many partners um, and engagements with security researchers like David Halton, David Weiner. Um, I'm not going to go down this whole list uh, point by point. One thing I, I do want to mention here um, is the the large feature that BitLocker is, right? Because our target of evaluation, our you know, the thing that we had to validate, starts from the BIOS, starts from the hardware, goes through the pre-OS, through the kernel, through you know, um, the administrative applications, up into Active Directory and into the cloud with Digital Locker. So uh, we had extensive um, analysis to, to do. Here are some of the things that we use for. For doing the, the. So one of the things uh, I should mention about penetration testing is, is that um, along with doing active penetration tests, there's, there's a lot of analysis that has to be done, right? Because 
uh, you, you have to be 